The Cod's Tale, Part 2. Cod becomes American. In the early 1600s, a small religious group that had fled from England to Holland was looking for a permanent home, a place where they could practice their religion and prosper. They considered an area on, nor- on the northeast coast of South America said to be El Dorado, the legendary lost city of gold. They also considered North America. And one day, these pilgrims gathered around a map of the coast of a little-known North American continent. The map had been drawn by John Smith, a famous British adventurer, and it showed a small hook of land with a funny name, Cape Cod. In 1602, Bartholomew Gosnold, a British explorer, had named the peninsula Cape Cod when when sailing the New England coast. He reported that his ship had been constantly pestered by cod. In 1614, John Smith who had helped establish a permanent British colony at Jamestown with Gosnold, charted the coastline of New England. He used Gosnold's name for the peninsula of Cape Cod. The voyage was famous for Smith having earned a fortune by catching 47,000 cod off the coast of America and selling them in southern Spain. In 1620, the pilgrims set sail on the Mayflower and landed near Cape Cod, hoping to catch cod and sell it for great sums of money too, they decided to settle there and name their colony Plymouth. Winter in Massachusetts. During their first two years in America, many pilgrims starved to death. Winter in Massachusetts was snowy and so cold that some Europeans believed this new land was uninhabitable. The hungry pilgrims could have survived on dried cod as the Vikings had done farther north, except the pilgrims did not know how to fish or hunt, nor did they know much about farming. Often they had to resort to stealing the hidden food reserves of the native people. These natives called themselves the Wampanoag. They made lines from vegetable fibers, made hooks from bones, and caught cod and other fish that swam near the coastline. They loved eating the clams they gathered on the shoreline and even showed the pilgrims how to pry them open. But the pilgrims were not familiar with clams and would not eat them at first. Only in desperation, nearly starving, would they eat clams and lobster, which grew to great sizes and crawled out of the sea onto the beaches. The pilgrims were determined to succeed. They sent back to England for equipment and advice. They learned how to fish cod, dry it and salt it, and to plow the fish waste into the soil for fertilizer. From the Wampanoag, they learned about farming local crops such as corn, beans, and squash. Slowly, as they became successful fishermen, they established fishing stations along the New England coast. Finally, they not only had food, but something valuable to trade. In 1640, they sold a record 300,000 dried cod to Europe. The Cod Revolution. By the 1650s, New England was becoming an important commercial center. Cod from the coast of New England, Labrador, Newfoundland, and Nova Scotia was brought to Boston, sold to merchants who shipped it to Europe. A city was being built around Boston's deep, sheltered harbor, and the waterfront was a forest of masts, cross spires, and riggings of ships from around the Atlantic. One of Boston's leading trade partners was the Basque port of Bilboa. The Boston merchants sold cod to the Basques, and the Basques sold them oranges, wine, and products made of iron. More and more people moved to New England, not only to fish for cod, but to be merchants, shipbuilders, farmers and craftsmen, carpenters, blacksmiths, barrel makers, furniture makers, to provide goods to a prosperous and growing colony. The cod trade transformed New England from a ragged pioneer outpost to a thriving society of growing cities and towns. Cod became the symbol of prosperity. In Massachusetts, carvings of cod decorated houses, churches, and government buildings. The merchant families of Boston who grew wealthy trading cod became known as the codfish aristocracy. The American Revolution. The New England colonies were ruled by the British government. When the British king decided to control the rebellious colonists by taxing them on important trade items such as molasses and tea, the colonists were furious. They had been doing well without British participation. Then further laws were passed that limited even the rights of Americans to trade cod. But by then, the American Revolution had begun. From 1775 to 1781, 13 of the American colonies fought the British. 
The colonies of the far north, Nova Scotia, Quebec, and Newfoundland, remained in the British Empire. It was too cold to fish for cod in their northern winters, and so they did not develop as prosperous an economy as had given the lower 13 a feeling of independence. When, in 1782, they began to negotiate peace with the British, the most difficult point to resolve was the right of the newly independent Americans to fish cod. In the 1880s, the British invented a large steel engine-powered fishing boat that dragged a large net to catch fish. The British were catching and eating large amounts of cod. It was the base for the most popular British fish meal, fish and chips, batter fried cod with french fries. Soon all the nations of northern Europe fished with this type of boat. They all ate cod. The Dan Danish ate it fresh with mustard for New Year's Eve. Sicilians ate salt cod for Christmas dinner. The Basques ate it salted with wonderful sauces. Caribbeans mashed their salt cod and ate it with hot peppers. The Portuguese fried it with potatoes. The Europeans caught many more fish with their new steel ships, but after 10 years there were fewer cod in northern Europe and the new ships were not catching as many, so they built even bigger ships with bigger nets and took more fish. 20th century. In the early 20th century, a young New Yorker named Clarence Birdseye went fur trapping in Labrador, Canada. He learned to freeze vegetables in the Arctic wind and could thaw them to feed his family during the long cold winter. In 1924, he moved to the fishing port of Gloucester in Massachusetts and established a frozen fish factory. Now there was more than just salted cod and fresh cod, there was frozen cod. Machines cut fillets and put them in boxes. Other machines cut fish into sticks. Frozen fish became a popular food for school lunches and in homes all over the United States, especially in places ocean fish had not been available before, such as the Midwest. Fishermen learned to freeze fish on their ships. Now, they did not have to return to port to sell fresh fish. They could haul up thousands of tons of fish in giant nets, week after week, and keep them frozen. After World War II, submarine hunting techniques, such as spotted airplanes and sonar, were used to find the fish in the ocean. The nets scraped along the bottom of the sea for miles. There was no longer any place for a cod to hide. The Last Cod most of the fishing nations of the world started to believe that they no longer had enough fish in their waters to share with fishermen of other nations. The Icelanders and the British even fought wars over who could fish for cod in Icelandic water. In 1975, after the third of these cod wars, Iceland declared that only their own fishermen could fish in the ocean within 200 miles of their shore. Soon most other nations followed and declared the same kind of zones but the fishermen caught less fish because there were fewer and fewer and fewer fish left to catch. Not only cod were disappearing. Now, an estimated 60% of the species of fish that are popularly eaten are showing signs of disappearing. Tuna, swordfish, and salmon are becoming scarcer in the Atlantic. And with fewer fish in the Atlantic, fishermen are moving their big nests to the Pacific. There are still a few cod left in the North Atlantic Ocean, but governments and fishermen have to learn how to limit what they catch, or soon there will be no big fish left in the ocean at all. And then, what will happen to the humpback whale, and the seals that eat cod bellies, and the birds that eat fish, and to the smaller fish that the cod eat, and to the smaller fish they eat, and to the zooplankton, and the phytoplankton, and what will happen to man if there are no more fish?